Welcome to the CMO Spotlight. And I'm here with Brandon Coleman, who's the Chief Marketing Officer for Dave & Buster's. Welcome, Brandon. Morning, Joe. How are you doing? Doing great, thank you. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you. We've known each other for a little while, um, and, and I want to just hear a little bit more about Dave & Buster's and what the company is all about, and then a little bit more about your role there at the company. Yeah, uh, Dave & Buster's, 40-year-old uh, brand. Um, but going strong as ever. We just actually posted one of our best quarter, our best quarter ever um, last quarter. So good brand, good good uh, good history. But it's it's really staying strong and it's very relevant right now um, with gaming and the experience economy. So we have a, a, an excellent positioning. What we do is we offer both food, games, uh, uh, sports watching, and and a full bar. Um, and that comes together for some really incredible uh, adult fun uh, at night. And then during the day, you know, we also have families that, that enjoy us as well. Awesome. And so I think I read that you have around 145 stores and they're, they're all company owned. They're not franchises or something like that. That's correct. We are moving international and franchising out international. So there's a great opportunity for some franchise partners there. But as far as the, uh, the core base is, is all company owned. Right. And, and, and publicly traded too. Publicly traded. P-L-A-Y. Play. Perfect. Play. Awesome. Uh, I love it. Game. I love it. Love it. So, all right. Well, so, so if you could just tell us a little bit about your role as chief marketing officer, what does that entail? Yeah, absolutely. As chief marketing officer, I oversee marketing. Um, and then I also oversee food and beverage development and uh, our special event sales, as well as our guest relations process. It's interesting. I, I've talked to some other um chief marketing officers of restaurant organizations, the fact that you do have impact on menu development, for example, is a little unique, I think, maybe to the restaurant business. Not, you know, In many marketing roles, you don't have an impact on the product. So I'm wondering if you could just tell a little bit about, you know, how, do you know, how do you keep from gaining 20 pounds trying all <laughs> new, new dishes and things like that? This is plus 20. So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's, it's difficult um, because we have an incredible chef um, who creates a lot of great items, but it was typically, you know, the process there is, is we establish a, a, a food and beverage strategy. And then, and then we, um, we do have what we're called, we call cuttings and where we taste the food. Um, we look at different options and we consider how it is or how it will be received, uh, with our guest. So it's, what's the interesting and most challenging thing is to keep personal preferences out and to really, right transform like you know like think about the guests and put the guests first and think about what they want what they want to eat how they behave what they order today and and then the other side of that is is thinking about the future a lot of times um uh you know focus groups come up as a potential input to these but um you know i i think i think focus groups can be rather limiting on on food and beverage development and you won't catch you know the the the, the um you know you won't catch those comments that are uh, on the bleeding edge or, or those things that really make a, a statement. Like um, I, I guarantee you, if we would put a, a, ta a taco burger in front of the guest as a concept uh, screener, they would have been like, I, I'm lost. I don't understand. But right now we have this incredible burger that has a combination of mini tacos on it and a tostada. And it's just, it's way over the top, top but it's, it's, it's on fire. I mean, it is, it's, uh, it's selling well and it's kind of like a, almost like a challenge of whether or not you eat, you can eat the whole thing. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's an, and it actually surprisingly from a culinary aspect, the flavor is outstanding. So, uh, you're making me it's not just, it's not just a monstrosity of like tacos and burgers combined. It's actually delicious. So, um, I would, uh, I'd highly recommend it if you get a chance. Very cool. Well, I, I uh, you know, we have, we're recording this before lunch, so I might, might have to, you know, find a way to get one for lunch today. Um, so I know you've spent a good chunk of your career in the restaurant business. I think you started out on the agency side and then moved, moved pretty quickly into the restaurant business. So I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your career path that led you to this current role. Yeah. So um, I, my dad, when I was young, he ran uh, ad agencies and my mom actually worked in the restaurant business as well as a few other things. And um, and so like I never knew it would come full circle, but I started <laughs> off uh, going to school for marketing at Texas A&M. And then after school, I, I wanted to be right in the thick of it. I want to be on you know Mass and Ave. So I went to New York and I worked for McCann Erickson. Um, I got there through several consecutive internships with ESPN and then Universal McCann and then McCann Erickson. And so 
I started off ad world, you know, averaging 80 hours a week. Uh, it was, it was pretty incredible. Um, and, you know, part of that 80 hours was, you know, just staying late so that I could get free dinner and a car ride home. Uh, and so I was so broke. Uh, but the other part of it was just a tremendous amount of work. I mean, uh, we were working on Intel and, um, you know, we had a global partner, global client that we had, uh, uh, had offices and, and clients all over, all over the world. And so really, um, uh, getting kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant for the first uh, for for the years I was in New York, and so um, it, it was incredible, and it was a great learning opportunity. And I was sharing some of these incredible experiences and 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 unique campaigns and tactics that we were we were experimenting with in New York. I was sharing it with uh, a couple of CEOs, and that my dad had introduced me to, and they said, "You know what? We want you to do that for us in the restaurant mm. industry." Yeah, so is it is a unique opportunity to leave New York? Um, God, I don't even know how. I think I was like 24, 25 and head up marketing for Johnny Carinos. And so it was a spectacular brand, really lots of growth. Um, this was 2006 and um, it was it was uh, 2007, excuse me. Um, but um, it was it was awesome. And they gave me a lot of room to 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 try and to fail. And, and I that was um, such a formative experience for to have leadership that really let let you run with with uh, ideas and opportunities, and I learned a tremendous amount thanks to their um, their openness. Well, uh, it sounds like you were in some ways born to do what you do today. In terms of you know, restaurant marketing is in your blood for, from both sides of the family, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of a joke because I, I actually named all the items on the kids menu um at this restaurant concept my mom worked at called Rio Ranch in Houston and so like a long time ago it's uh, uh but it I got to I got the ability to name all the the the, the kids menu items <laughs> you know cool. so that was that was my first uh foray into it so. so so you talked a little bit about kind of early in your career you know at McCann Erickson I'm wondering you if there's either a piece of advice that you got that you really cherished or is there a piece of advice you'd give somebody that's pretty early in their career. Hey, I just graduated college with a shiny new marketing degree. Now what? Yeah, you know, I would say there are two things you can control. One is your attitude and the second is your effort and, and like how you process things. Um, you know, you come out of college, you've got a, a lot of excitement. You're ready to take on the whole world. You have a critical eye to the way things should be done but there are things you don't know, right? And there are things that you haven't experienced and, and but you can't let that, that change your attitude. You gotta have this great, like, yes, and, uh, you know, give, I'll take on more, I'll do more, I, I will learn more. If I don't know it, I'll figure it out. You know, I mean, this type, that, that's, I think that's that, that thing that, that helped me the most was just knowing that like, you can control your attitude, right? Like, you know, whether it rains or whether it's <laughs> the sun is shining, like, doesn't matter. You control your attitude. And so you, you, you take that positive attitude, you take, you know, the, everybody, everybody has, you know, nobody ever promised that this was going to be easy or that this wasn't <laughs> going to come with any lumps or anything like that. They, it is what it is. And you just got to be positive. And, and then the second piece is the effort and just get after it, especially when you're young. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I probably over indexed at 80 hour weeks, but I think, I think really that hustle is really important and, and that, you know, creates opportunities. And, and I think that I've been very fortunate because I've gotten opportunities that, that not everybody's gotten, but I think at the same time, you have to have that positive outlook to, to see them and recognize them. And then that effort to go out and grab them when, when they do come up, because, um, you know, things that pass you by, you know, those, those are missed opportunities. hundred percent. So uh, I believe that everybody has a superpower and I'm curious what either you feel your superpower is, or maybe what people have told you your superpower is. You know, um, hmm, that is interesting. Uh, I could go a couple different ways with this. I'll, I'll, I'll say that really how I differentiated myself and kind of what I've been, um, um, where I've been successful is to be a business creative and, and really orient myself towards the business uh, metrics, the business KPIs, the, the, the EBITDA, the revenue, the middle of the PL, and understanding that in a lot of depth um, in order to then find creative solutions for marketing to drive value. 
Um, I am not a marketer first. I'm a business person first and then a marketer second. And I think that that differentiation has enabled me to, to really, you know, work well with CEOs. And, and, and I think that's, and honestly, you know, one CEO I worked really well with was Norman Abdallah and he was, uh, you know, he's a well-known restaurant industry CEO and he's taken me, he took me through multiple different concepts and, and that, that is so important to form that relationship with your leaders um, and, and to have the, the respect, especially as marketing, you know, cause I think, you know, I, I read something that like only in the last 15 years is G or 20 years, maybe G added a marketer to the board. Right. right? right and it's right. like, it, it, you know, I think there's some companies that have this perspective that marketing is all, you know, colors and, and, and fun and crazy ideas. And, and I think that, as marketers, that's what we're we're fighting against. But you're seeing more and more the understanding that the customer is the focus, and the understanding that the strategy uh, comes from which customer you're focused on, and the strategy is is paramount in delivering value in an organization. So you're seeing more and more CMOs actually taking the CEO role, and I think that that's because they have that they're they're not just talking about you know how many how many likes or how many, you know, right. how many people shared, you know, I mean, those are important metrics that should be linked to driving business. I don't think that you should throw those out the window and say, we're only focused on EBITDA. I think that your marketing won't connect then. Um, but you, you have to find the right balance of, of the, the metrics that marketers talk about and the metrics that the CEO and, and the CFO talk about. Yep. I love that. Um, and, and you preempted a question that I normally ask during these conversations, which is how does marketing you know, how do we demonstrate the value of marketing to the non-marketing functions within the organization? But I think you just answered that, which is focus on the business first and, and, and the marketing then drives the business. And, and it doesn't, and it can be looked as, as a business driver instead of a cost center in some organizations. Yeah. And I, here's what I would also say. I would also, I would also parse out what is um, intended to drive return on investment and what is um, intended to drive brand awareness. I, I would be specific about your goals. And I think that's what marketers can really, and, and be accountable for your results. So be specific about your goals and accountable for your results. I think that's incredibly important. If, you know, we just did this cool thing where uh, we did B and B, uh, or excuse me, D and B, B and B. So like, right, like take on Airbnb, but Dave and Buster style. And right. so we set up this great, like uh, cool, like uh, room and suite in Miami. And we put out a UGC contest in order to get um, uh, people to, to enter to win. And I mean, it's just gotten tremendous traction, right? But that's not, that's not an ROI program, right? Like right, I'm not, right. I'm not saying, well, how many people came in because of this, right? But what it did is, I mean, it's hitting all the news wires. It's getting tons of traction on social. And that's creating that awareness that feeds that funnel into consideration and the trial and et cetera. So what I, what I really think is, is understand, like, I'm not going to write a, a return on investment analysis for the DMB, BNB, right? right. But, I, but, but I guess I'll tell you what, if we do a eat and play combo, you guarantee you we are going to run the traps on that and look at what did it do on, for the business specifically and what was the return on media spend. So I think that's that's um, that's a distinction to make. Just be clear about goals, um, and and I think that that will help you with your financial partners. I think when people try to come in and go, we got like X number of likes, and that probably drove up the business. It's like, well, where's the probably goal? is not a good word, right? right. Yeah. Um, you, I think you started at Dave and Buster's right in February of 2020. <laughs> so, so I know obviously initially you had to shut down stores and then, so I'm curious, obviously now coming out of the pandemic, you all are busy again, but you know, what's the first thing you do when you get hit in the mouth with something that you totally weren't looking for and all the stores close and, and then how do you, how do you react to that? Yeah. You know that we, Dave, and, I, I think it's dependent on your situation, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, um. Dave and Buster's was in a place, and this is all public information and you yeah. read about it, but uh, Dave and Buster's was in a place they just done a big stock buyback and they're a little bit low on cash. So it was a very difficult and different place than a lot of our competitors. So we were very aggressive and, and we asked our partners to help us, right? And we just went to every partner, hey, we've got a five-year contract. Can we delay it? Can we cancel it? Can we get, and, and we had, I would say, probably 80% of our partners really just showed up 
and, mm-hmm. and really helped us. But we had some that um, were like, no, we can't, we can't do that for you. And I'll, I'll tell you that those are, those are not partners we carried forward or we're looking for, we're, we're still looking for a, a replacement there. So that was, it was so important to me, like, you know, the, the understanding that like, we don't have people coming to the door. We have zero revenue. We have a cash problem. Like that, that was, that was, it was a tough time. Yeah. It was a really tough but, time. But it was, also, it was come- way tougher for our team members in the field. I mean, like uh, just e- exceptionally tough, like heart wrenching. And so what, you know, the best thing you can do though, is, is you got to focus on the future because Dave and Buster's has to make it through in order to re-employ all these people. Right. And it's a very tough, tough place to be. And, and I know our CEO at the time had to make some really tough decisions. Um, but as a marketer, it's, you know, it, we, we were shutting down everything we could. Um, yeah. At the same time, you know, opportunistically, I got to rewrite everything. The, our approach to media, we would start with a zero based budget and, and, and we built back up and we start, we rewrote our whole, our, our MarTech platform. I, I think 90% of our MarTech was new within the last two years or is new within the last two years. Um, so we rewrote everything. We, we, we kind of created a whole new plan of what the future is going to look like, which is a CMO coming in. You always want to do but you, you, you have resistance of how things have been or like these contracts or whatever. So in some ways, beneficial for a new CMO to be able to like wipe the slate. Clean yeah, clean slate, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, I'll give you an analogy. Um, you know, we're, I'm based here in Atlanta and there's a Mexican restaurant, just a local you know, Mexican restaurant here. And as soon as the pandemic shut down, I noticed there was a construction project happening at the restaurant and they built a massive deck on the front and they build a massive deck on the back of the restaurant. And I thought that, that's brilliant. I mean, you know, uh, uh, there, it's never in poor taste to fix up your house. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And, and, great, and, and my analogy was, was, you know, what is your deck? What, what deck are you building right. you know, while you have this opportunity to reinvent your, your, your restaurant? And in your case, you know, systems and tools and things and relationships in some, some ways. Um, so that's really, that's really cool. I'm curious. Um, if there are some values that you want to demonstrate to your team, or are there some values that you demand of people that are on your team? Yeah. Um, so, so when I look at team members, by the way, I love your your deck analogy. I think that's that. I wish I would have had that because I, I, I'll send you. A, I have a blog post <laughs> I think that I wrote back at the time. I'll have to send you that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. No, that's really sharp. I like it. Um, the, the you know, as far as values for my team, look, I, I look for people who are driven, people who are honest and transparent and people who are smart. So I, I like, you know, and then nice as well. So I'll say those four <laughs> things. I think Warren Buffett, I, I stole those first three from Warren Buffett. I think right. just repeating, regurgitating what other people say. Right. So, um, but no, the first three are from Warren Buffett, but I, I also think it's important to have teamwork and, and somebody who's willing to, um, uh, you know, have a good time and create a fun environment with, with their team members. So, um, you know, somebody who's, who's honest and transparent information has to flow. Right. And that's one of the key things I communicate to my team is like, tell me as soon as something goes wrong, don't, and, and some right. people say, well, get a solution, then come to me. No, I want to know as soon as something goes wrong. And if you tell me, Hey, this happened working on a solution. Great. But I, I think that information can travel so fast and there's so many different facets of the business of Dave and Buster's and especially large businesses that, there may be implications that if you go out and try to solve something immediately, you might miss something, right? So that's why I always tell my team, like first time something bad happens, alert me. Um, the second thing is like, we really focus, and this is a constant you know, um, improvement process, but are we really focused on how do we support operations? Because they are the tip of the spear for the business. They interact with the, the guest, um, they create the experience for the guest and, and the guest experience can never exceed the team member experience, right? If your team, if your team's having a bad day, or if you're really putting them to the ringer on process, or you're not supporting them and they don't feel supported, then the guest is going to feel that. And right. so, we really, you know, our our second piece is focus on on the guest, on the excuse me, on the on the um, on the team members and make sure they're supported. So we want to make make sure we're honest, transparent, information flows. We want to make sure we support the team members. And then we get to marketing, which is kind of crazy. Like those are kind of the first two values and they have nothing to do with marketing specifically. But then we get to marketing, we say, okay, so again, define our goals, right? Make sure we're always measuring. 
And so define our goals like, hey, we want to do DMB and BNB. Why do you want to do it? Because it's fun and because mm-hmm. it can generate PR, right? Like that, we want to generate a lot of PR. That was the intent going in, success on those metrics. If you would have defined it as it's an EBITDA play, loss, right? Right, so right, right. That's where like we really focus on like defining what, what is the intent of this? And we try to, you know, we try to do the old 70, 20, 10 uh, methodology, um, trying to keep 70% of our stuff towards proven traffic driving tactics and then um, 20% look alike, 10% completely new, right? And so we we use this this idea that we got to define our goals for each, each activation and, and understanding how we build full funnel approaches. And my team's done an amazing job, got a great team on that side, um, on the marketing side, and they've really uh, ha- made an incredible impact on the business and on the brand because of that. So I would say those are, those are the core values, um, you know, looking at, at, uh, both hiring, uh, and making sure you start with, with nice people who are honest, driven and smart, then making sure information flows, then making sure you support the, the, the front line. And then, uh, tertiary is making sure that we define our goals. And with that, you know, if we define our goals, innovation, or we define anything, we, we can get out there and try new stuff and have fun. So love that. So I'm going to shift gears a little. Um, as you know, set up, we're, we're marketing matchmakers, and that often means we connect brands and marketing agencies together. I'm just curious, generally, how you work with agencies, either today at Dave & Buster's or maybe in a past life. Um, do, you, do you usually work with agency of records, or do you have a group of specialists, or, or what is your just thinking on working with agencies in general? Yeah, we, um, you know, I've always taken a, like, more of a hub and spoke model where where the brand is owned internally but you have different partners for different things that um you know where they really uh, have a lot of specialization so uh, you know th- that that that's a continuum though because right. like sometimes we index with a bigger brand more towards an aor like we are here at dave and busters with mother and they've done an amazing job but we st- we still have act- outside partners for activation we still have outside partners for digital owned properties. We have outside partners for a lot of things. I don't like taking like, here's our loyalty program. Here's our, here's everything we own and giving it to one agency. Right, right, right. Nobody can be that a specialist in every area. And I think sometimes you, sometimes it's, well, I'll say it's definitively harder to manage with this hub and spoke model. And so that falls on the team and it puts more work on the team. Right. But I think the benefit is, is, is there. Right, you get discipline um, think, expertise maybe because you're getting an agency that's really good at this one discipline, even though there are more agencies to manage when you do that. Yeah, and I think that especially under duress, people orient toward what they're most comfortable with. So in a situation where maybe sales aren't going well, well the agency is going to throw, an agency that's that's really focused on, on TV is going to throw more right. resources at, the, the creative and the TV creative when that may not be the challenge. Right. And so I think that, and I think this is true of individuals as, as well as or organizations. Um, you know, if, you know, when, 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 you, if you see a CFO diving into spreadsheets, they're under a tremendous amount of stress and right. they're not, they're right. not in the right mind frame. Right. Like, like they, they're supposed to be bigger picture than that, but like they're going to what's comfortable. Well, I'm just going to hammer this out. Right. And I think a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I've done that before. Like, well, okay, I'm going to build the presentation myself. And I'm just like, okay, wait a second. This is, I'm going, this isn't helping anybody. Right, right. Like, this is not my role, right? I, I, my role is to lift up others so that we can create uh, uh, meaningful work and, and make an impact. But as soon as I get too, like too down in the weeds, then, then you know, it's not helping anybody. So I think agencies kind of follow that or, or I'd say any organization yeah. um, will kind of if, if when they're under pressure they'll they'll drift towards what they know and what they're comfortable with and so i would i mean i would like all my agencies to be under pressure and all drifting towards what they own right, like right. if you own tv creative yeah drift towards that if you own loyalty drift towards that because then when the business is under stress everybody's focused on the thing they're best right. at and i think you know i mean as a public company we're constantly under stress of what the next quarter is going to be and how do we drive that so yeah i'm um, curious if there are certain disciplines of marketing that you always you feel that you would always want to own in-house and not outsource to you know outside partners like an agency and are there certain disciplines where you always want to get outside perspective i don't always is a strong word but i'm just saying yeah you know, are there certain things you feel you should own and there are certain things you feel you you need external um 
you know, no, I, I think, I, I don't think there's a, a one size fits all approach for me. Um, each, each situation is okay. What's our, what's our budget for, for human capital at this particular organization? Is it light? Is it heavy? You know, like where, where can, like, can I invest in internal social or should I keep that external? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's, every situation is unique. Um, and I've had the benefit of working with the, the CEO that I pre previously mentioned who, who worked a lot on um, private equity businesses. So we had mm -hmm. a lot of turns. So I got to see a lot of different brands and take a lot of different approaches. And I, and I really don't, there's not a one model that I subscribe to every time. The hub and spoke with a, you know, with a, a, uh, a slider, if you will, on how heavy we focus on a singular AOR but never a, and never everything at one agency. Mm -hmm. um, and then I say like some agents, some places brand strategy came inside, right? Some places like Del Frisco's when I was president there, um, I brought in, uh, or we, sorry, excuse me, the, the, the organization brought in uh, uh, Bain and they did an incredible job of setting the strategy for us. Um, and we just lived it and we executed it. And it was, it was tremendous. I mean, we, we, turn the brand after a long string of negative uh, uh, quarters of same store sales, we turned positive. And it was, it was because we focused on a singular strategy. And I'd say that's the most important thing as a marketer is, is make sure that you don't, your marketing strategy feeds into what the organizational strategy is. And if your organization doesn't have a strategy, I recommend pushing very hard to get a very clear organizational strategy. Um, so yeah, I love that. All right, I have one more marketing related question and then there's some fun questions just for fun to kind of wrap things up. I'm curious if there's a campaign or a program or something that you did either, either at Dave & Buster's or in a previous life that taught you a great deal or taught you a really important lesson, either because it was a huge failure and you learned something or it was a huge success that you may want to emulate in the future. Mm, okay. Can I do three? Is yeah, that, sure. Is that, okay. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll, the first one I'll do is when I came straight out of New York and I came into Johnny Carino's and I just was like, I was, oh, I've just been named director of marketing. I know what I'm doing. Like, uh, clearly, I'm I'm, 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 yeah, I was really high on it at that point and, um, and didn't know it either. That's the important point. <laughs> I just thought, you know, it's Midas touch or something. So um, I came in and the first campaign we did was called the Italian road trip. And we worked really hard on getting this campaign all together and, and getting all the effort and energy behind it. And I went into the store and I sat down on day one on all the media launch. And I was just like, oh yeah, this is going to be a great campaign. And I sat down on day one and I at a table and I, I asked the server, I was like, oh, I'd like to order this Italian road trip. And she looks at me and she goes, I wouldn't do that. And I paused and she goes, yeah, corporate's making us do that. I would go over here and do this. And it was like a gut shot. It was just like this cannonball. And I, so I waited till after her show, I was like, Hey, look, I'm CMO or I was, sorry, I was head of marketing there, uh, a director of marketing. And I said, um, Hey, look, I'm in charge of marketing. I, what did, what did I miss? Right. Yeah. Like, what, and she's like, oh, well, you know, it affects our tips in this way. It takes kitchen, this, 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 not good at lunch, blah, blah, blah. And sh so she went through everything. And, and what I realized in that moment, and it really changed the rest of my career and how I operate today is that I lacked empathy and an understanding for, um, for, for like, not only I was thinking about the guest, which every good marketer should, but I wasn't thinking about the team who had to deliver that. And, and that, that lack of empathy was just, it was a big miss. And, and um, so it taught me to, to really embrace operations that goes back to my values, um, but to really think about them and how we implement. Um, so that's really important to me. Well, before you get to the other two examples, that's, that's kudos to you for being open to the feedback and kudos to her for being willing to be honest and candid and teaching you that lesson that you probably needed to learn. I did. I needed it. I was, it was good. It was like a real good check down. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, it's interesting, Joe, because some of these lessons, I don't know that I can tell you, or I can tell somebody the lesson, right? I, I, I mean, I can certainly share my experience. I don't know if you really get it until you feel it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, and, and I've got two young kids, so I'm, I'm watching this as a, as, a, as they're growing up, but like, I think something, I mean, I think a lot of things we can go, oh, great. Okay. Got that. Like understand that fully. 
and but even with great self awareness, I I wonder if we don't have to just experience some of these things because it it really just solidifies it in our mind and our emotions and and it helps our brain you know remember it. Um, but we'll see. Uh, I'm trying to help my kids, but I think that some of these things are going to have to experience themselves. Um, second campaign, um, you know, something that was really, and one of the things I always say is really meaningful to me is that um, the we did a campaign at, at Macaroni Grill, uh, Simo, Simo there, and we had um, a an opportunity to support No Kid Hungry. Mm -hmm. And it's a great organization and we went in and they were they were we were we were working through like uh, okay how how do we how do we set our fundraising targets and how do we you know how do we execute this and we talked to them and they're like well you know usually like um uh 100 dollars would be a big first time campaign for anybody like we we don't we don't typically see anything more than that you know like in the month of september like usually it takes people multiple years and then they're able to build that steam and get above that. And so I said, okay, what, well, that doesn't sound very exciting, right? Like in, in today's world, like somebody gives a billion dollars like every other day. Right. And so I'm like macaroni grill, this large organization is going to give a hundred thousand. I was like, it doesn't really feel very meaningful. And I was like, well, I, I was like, what else, what else could we do here? Like, is there something, some other, like, something else we could talk about. I was like, because the $100,000 isn't meaningful to people. So what we said is, okay, how much does it cost to feed a kid? And because they're accessing government funds, every 10 cents they get, they can access a government fund to feed, to make sure a meal gets to a kid. And so they have all this research and, and data. And this was a long time ago, so it may have changed. But at the time, it cost them 10 cents to get a meal to a kid. I was like, so for $100,000, we, we feed a million kids? I was like, we can, we can crush that. And so we ended up blowing that out of the water. Um, we raised $310,000 in our first wow. year and it was, it was fed 3.1 million kids. It was, it was absolutely amazing. It was an incredible um, program and it, it, it meant a lot to me because it actually had a huge impact. Right. Um, and so that's an important lesson is make sure you're thinking about I mean, don't always just follow the path that's laid in front of you. Make sure you're asking the questions about, um, um, you know, what's meaningful to the guest. Hundred thousand dollars not meaningful to the guest. Million kids, absolutely right. So, um, it was it was just a it was a great learning experience for for our teams. You know, I, I would say that we didn't know we were going to hit that type of multiplier, but we we knew by changing the messaging to to be meaningful to the guests that it was going to improve the performance. And then the last one I'd say is, is just the eat and play combo that we recently ran at Dave and Buster's just absolutely crushed it. Like just killed it. And, but there was a tremendous amount of resistance. So it, it's a difficult balance and it's something that you'll have. I think that, that, that leaders will have to learn over time, but know when to go to the mat for something. Mm. Eat and play combo was something that we had done in the past and there wasn't a lot of love for it when I first brought it back up. Just explain what that is. It's, it's you buy a package with food and games included in the package, essentially. Exactly right. Joe, have you, you did the eat and play combo? You were I haven't, but I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So obviously Dave and Buster's has arcade games and food. Um, and, and we bundle those together for like a kind of a deal. Right. And, and it's a very classic setup uh, for a marketing to bundle and to package things together. Nothing groundbreaking there, but it had always been an always on type of program and we really focused it to a singular month and treated it more as an LTO than an always on program. And I knew that by doing this and having this incremental value, we we're going to tap into pin up demand for, for our, 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 um, for our stores. And, and one of the reasons I knew that is because I was listening to the guests, I was listening to the guest feedback. I was listening to the team when I was out in the field, ask them, I said, what, what could we do better? What could we bring? What could we you know, do to drive traffic for you? And this was constantly coming up. And so I had a confidence in this that when, you know, the team stood up and said, we've already done this. We've done this before. We don't want to go back to it. Too heavy discount. I said, look, we're going to rebuild it. So the discount is, is not uh, so that we upsell, really. So we upsell to offset the discount. And that's number one. Number two, this is a limited time offer. So it's not just going to, you know, uh, cannibalize our current guests. It's going to drive incremental visitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I had a lot of confidence. And so, like, you know, the CEO and I were even having debates of whether or not 
to run this. And, and I think that's the important part. And, you know, my team really helped me, you know, stand the ground on this with, with information, data, reasons to believe. Um, but I think sometimes you have to, to trust what, what, what you're recommending and, and really push, I mean, to the point where it got uncomfortable uh, for pushing. And I had to push past that barrier to get this live. And, and the team pushed past that barrier to get this live. And it was incredible. And, and, and look, here's the other thing I'll, I'll tell people would be, you're, everybody has experiences. Those experiences create beliefs, which create thoughts, which create actions. And, and they, everybody has different experiences, right? So, so like when people run up against, and this is probably advice I would have given to myself younger, is like when a CFO comes up against you, it's not because it's not nothing personal, it, but it is, it is based on the experiences they've had that created the beliefs that they have. And then that leads to the thoughts and the actions. So it, I think people should see that as an opportunity to, to engage and really break down the argument instead of just saying like, oh, it's a pushback. I can't do it. Or like, like, okay, wait, you're saying we're going to lose money. Why are you saying that? Okay. Why are you saying that? Like ask the three whys, right? Mm -hmm. three whys. Ask that, understand where this is coming from. And then, you know, compare and contrast that with what you believe and see, maybe they're right. Like, and that's the other part. This is where like, it takes experience to understand that sometimes they're right. And you're like, you missed something and you just need to know, go, oh, Either we can address that or you're right, we should pivot out of that. Yeah, but sometimes say, you say, yeah. hey, you know what, that, that, that's a good point, but did you, did you go this way with it? Did you think about this? Or we, we built it in a different way than we have in the past. So I think there's, there's a time when, when you, you go for it and you push hard mm -hmm. and, and you go all the way through to whatever it takes to get it live. But you have to make sure you have, that it's not a blind uh, confidence, that you've checked uh, with your team members, you've got an outside perspective, you understand the arguments against it. Um, and you can go through it. Yeah. So sorry, you asked me like one brief question, like I've got a lot of that's fun. Okay. I, like, it does. Oh, let like, me just go off. <laughs> but, but I think sometimes to that, that last point that, I mean, they're, 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 yes, they're pushing back, but maybe there's some holes in your plan that you didn't yeah. consider. And so maybe that's helping you plug those holes and make it into a better plan. Two ears, one mouth. <laughs> I'm listening. Uh, all right. So I've got a couple of fun questions that have nothing to do with marketing. The first is, is there a book or a movie or a band or a quote or a sports team or something that inspires you? And what is it about that that inspires you? Oh, God. Um, wow. There's so much there. Um, I would say I would say I get I get inspiration from all of those things. I think that, you know, I, for me, there's, there's not one thing, and this is my personality, right? Like there's not one thing that every day I come back to, right? There's, there are, there are, there are things that, um, that drive me, but the, the inspiration comes from multiple places. And I think this is important for anybody in, in a leadership position is to open yourself up, right? Empty your cup and open yourself up to, new inputs and new learnings. As soon as you say, I know everything, you've stopped growing. Mm -hmm. And that, that's gotta be, that's incredibly challenging for a leader, especially with as fast as, um, you know, technology is moving today and, and, and the way the world is changing so quickly, you've got to have a willingness to say, I don't understand that. Walk me through that. What does that acronym mean? Like, tell me more <laughs> because you can, you can learn new things that get you excited about where the world's going. Like I'm so excited about the, the potential of metaverse right now and, and what is what is going to potentially come of that, right? And now I take it back to like old, like old school with McCann Erickson, we presented Second Life as like, everybody's going to do this. Like right. everybody's yeah. going to be in Second Life. It's finally Nobody coming around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. remember that? Like 2005? Oh, yeah, of course. And, and like it, it, it like, peaked really quickly and just totally bottomed out, right? Like, I mean, like all these big brands had stores in there, just like we're doing today, right? Like Gap and all these other things. Now I think the technology is different today. And I think you could get more immersive with, with um, you know, some of the, the, the different devices that are coming out. And I think that will accelerate it. Yeah. But, uh, and I remember in 2005 when this was the next big thing and it, it turned out to not be, but I am excited about where Metaverse is going. But my point in that is two years ago, 
maybe two and a half, I, I knew nothing about metaverse and, and didn't spend any time with it, didn't know Decentraland, didn't know, and I don't even know if it exists at that point, but like if, I, if I'm not open to saying like, Ooh, what is this? Ooh, or like having this excitement, then, then I can't get that inspiration. So I, my inspiration comes from a lot of different places. It's, it's not one quote, not one sports team, but, but really all of them and anything that mm -hmm. I find interesting and allow myself to dive into. Love it. Um, other than your family, where do you find joy outside of work? Do you have any hobbies or passions or things like that? You know, I, I love, obviously I love spending time with my family, but <laughs> um, I, I, I would say that I love the outdoors too, which is so funny because <laughs> Right now we have this campaign called uh, the great indoors. And so um, I'm actually like, like uh, berating the outdoors for, for like being too hot and uh, <laughs> right. murder hornets and stuff I mean, like you're that. You're in Texas and we're, um, we're here in Georgia and it's hot right now for sure. So. Right. But like, I actually love the outdoors, but it's kind of a funny juxtaposition we've done with Dave and Busters because obviously it's an indoor concept. And so um but like I'm having to release these quotes about how much we, we say like outdoors sucks right now. And, and um, it, it's fun, but like, I really do love the outdoors. I love, uh, I love fly fishing. I love, um, I, I don't do it very often, but I love spear fishing. I love surfing. I love anything, any type of adventure um, is really a, a calling for me. It's just like trying to get out there and, and learn something new and, and uh, have fun and explore um, nature is, is where I, I kind of orient towards. I also cool. like video games, so like I'm, it's a, it's a, it's a dichotomy there. <laughs> so. All right. So, so my last question is: Is there a brand that you've never worked on that you really admire, and what is it about the brand that you admire? Mm. There are there are several brands that I admire. Um, just off the top of my head, you know, I, I really admire what Liquid Death is doing right now. Yeah. Um, they're just a. I For love. For those not familiar, this is water in a can, but branded Liquid Death. Yes. Yes. So it's like, it's thank you. Cause a lot of people are like, Oh, sounds like a hard liquor brand. Right. I, but, uh, uh, liquid death. Yeah. They're an incredible brand. Um, they've, they've got water in a can and, but they take this like heavy metal approach to it and all the different creative stuff they've done has just been really, really well thought out and, and comes back to a consistent brand personality, right? Like they don't just do crazy stuff for crazy stuff's sake. And I, it's one thing you you know you push back on agencies. It's like, well, why? Why would you do that? Like, but Liquid Death established like we're going to be heavy metal, and I think it ties. I mean, I, I obviously don't know the strategy, but I think the metal probably ties back into the can because the water's mm -hmm. in a can and not a plastic bottle. And they talk about how cans are much more sustainable, but then they tie it all back to heavy metal. So they had a great Super Bowl spot where there's a bunch of kids, and then like essentially it was kids behaving like fraternity like a fraternity right. scene right like a fraternity party and like they're passed out with a liquid death can in their hand and it looks like they're all drinking right but like they are drinking but it's just water and so i think at the end it says relax it's just water that's great. um but that, they do a great job i'd say you know i'm i really admire uh brian nichols and the job he's done uh transferring from being a cmo um, I think at Yum, uh, I think it was where he was before, but then he went into to Chipotle and he's done a great job of turning that brand and really been- Yum, yum is, is Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, uh, if I'm remember correctly, right? Yes, you are, you are correct. Um, and I, uh, and KFC, Chipotle I is based in Denver or based in- Colorado. Totally separate. Um, I think yeah. they actually moved to Southern California. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know if KFC is really Yum anymore. Anyway, I, I don't uh, keep yeah. as much tabs on Yum, but um, but he's done a great job in his transition from being CMO to being a CEO. And, um, you know, he's, I really admire the clarity of his strategy, the way he's developed uh, um, the brand and, and really, you know, that brand was in free fall and he's really brought it back to life. And so I admire that as well. And there's other brands. I mean, love Alamo Draft House is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. It's a cool movie theater brand with a very specific brand personality um, and uh, a very uh, clear value add to the guests. I love Alamo Draft House um, and others. I mean, I could go on and on. I think there's some really great brands out there. It is interesting to me that all the brands you brought up were related to food and beverage in some way. So it tells you it's it's in your blood. Uh, it's in my I blood. I didn't hear Apple or Patagonia or you know or or test you know uh, or Amazon or something like that. So yeah, that tells you something about you that those are the brands that you most admire or, or you know. Uh, I, think I think it's in your blood. I think it's like uh, how a race car driver probably appreciates more 
watching racing because they understand the complexity of what is actually going on, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the little, yeah, new right. ones. so therefore I, like I, I went from advertising and in, in like 2006, 2007, I was moved into food and beverage and have essentially with a few little tips here and there, but essentially been there the whole time. And so, um, you know, that, that 15 years will, will influence you to go, Oh, wow, I really, Oh, I see what they did there and, and actually be able to yeah. see and appreciate some of the more nuanced things. I actually got a bone to pick with Apple. I, every time I walk in there, they treat me like I'm a brand new customer and I'm like, right. you they know, should, they should have how many things to know. In fact, when you walk in, they should, they should, you, the Bluetooth on your phone should immediately alert you that Brandon Coleman is in the store. Yeah. Like, and that's my thing is like, for, for somebody who is based in, you know, technology and data, like wow. they have no clue what, what I'm like, I, like, oh, you want a new phone? Oh, okay. And it's like, do you know that I've bought three in the last, like, is there right. like or, 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 that, or that my phone is four years old and I'm ready for an upgrade. You should know that. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like they could do so much better job and I, I don't want to piss off Apple, but just as far as knowing their customer and, and I know they're big on data privacy. So maybe this is, against kind of their core value set, but, but it seems like I, you could be a little bit smarter and how you, and I still get like black email blasts. I feel like they're just campaign based and not journey based or anything like that. And so I, I just, I, I would say they could do a better job and I'm a big Apple fan, right? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, um, I, I, all my products are Apple. I just wish they would do, I wish they would know me better. So I, I think that's a good point. And uh, I love that you focus on the customer experience, the guest experience in your case, and also the team, the team, you know, that delivers that experience. Those are two very important constituents for you particularly, but for any organization, it's not just, you know, as bosses and leaders, it's not just about our customer. It's about our team that delivers products or services to those customers. So I appreciate that about you and your focus. Uh, So Anyway, I want to thank you. Brandon Coleman is the Chief Marketing Officer of Dave & Buster's. I really enjoyed this time together. Thanks a lot, Brandon. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Joe.